Good morning, LVC. My name is Victor Otieno, and I am an intern at LVC. I have the privilege of bringing you God's word this morning. But before we get to that, I would like us to usher in the Advent Sunday, the Advent season this Sunday, by lighting up the first Advent candle and reading from God's word from the book of Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to chapter 2, verse 23. To take us through that is the family of Mr. and Mrs. Chelule, Valerie and Leonard. Let us hear from them. Hello, Hello Chad. Chad. How are you? Today, Valerie, Kaliet, yes. and Ngeno from the Chelule family are going to light for you the candle of hope to mark the beginning of Advent. So... Today we light the candle of hope. As the flame begins to burn on this first candle of Advent, we are reminded how far we've come. From our ancestors of the faith who walked in the wilderness for 40 years to the year that we have all experienced together. Hope does not come from instant gratification. Instead, it comes from a longing inside of us that knows things can be different. And yet, this year we have learned how to wait and hope at the same time. As we light the candle of hope, we acknowledge a longing inside of all of us. We acknowledge the tension between waiting and hoping. We acknowledge the stubborn hope that holds us in one with each other as we begin our journey through Advent. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy God we thank you for the gift of hope and we, that we find in Christ Jesus. Remind us of your presence as we live another week, another week of hoping and longing. Amen. Matthew 1, 18 to 23. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was played to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and uh, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Bye. Bye bye, Bye Chad. Such beautiful words from the word of God in the book of Matthew. Shall we pray? Our God who alone is compassionate, just, and faithful, please help us to see all the wondrous things from your law. Through your word, may we be rebuked, may we be taught, may we be corrected. May we be trained in righteousness. Help us to love the things that you love and to turn away from the things that do not please you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us consider these words. The greatness of any nation lies in its fidelity to the constitution and adherence to the rule of law and above all, respect to God. Now, these are the words of the Chief Justice of Kenya, David Kenani Maraga. During what I would call one of, the most, one of the most distinct moments in the history of our nation, Kenya, when he called for a rerun after declaring null and void the presidential elections. Now, just looking at those words, the greatness of a nation lies in its fidelity to the constitution and adherence to the rule of law and above all, respect to God. I would like us to examine ourselves honestly and evaluate on the basis of these principles where we stand. Sadly, 
We are far from being the nation or nations that revere God and adhere to the rule of law. We may have seen this in the following ways. When seeking public services, things seem to work faster when you can pay a bribe. Our news channels are replete with headlines of misappropriation of public funds. There is a global, if not a global, but all around us we see disregard for people's rights by those in power through undue force and through brutality. And sadly, still, some that have claimed to be church leaders seem to be out to extort the congregants for their gain. So clearly our problem is that we seem to have set our hearts on uh, things like power and money, among other things that seem to be our idols, and we would do anything to gain these, especially by being unjust and being violent. This problem, or the root of this problem, is certainly deeper, and it is pegged on our lack of reverence for God. But it also points to our need, for, to our need as believers that in whatever role we play in our communities, to be the difference, to show impartiality, to show justice and to show regard for others. And we will see that in the book of Micah, things were not different for Israel and Judah. Micah began his prophetic ministry around 742 BC during the reign of kings Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah. These were kings in the kingdom of Judah. He was a contemporary to Hosea and Isaiah. Now, when you look at Micah chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep slope. All this for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression, tra what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, all her wages shall be burned with fire, and, uh, and all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. Now we know that uh, if you read through the, re the rest of the chapter, you will see that he goes ahead to call for mourning. Uh, he goes ahead to call for uh, them to flee. But, most imp but even, even, even sadly still, at the very end, chapter 1, verse 16, he actually promises that uh, the children, their children will go into exile. Now, Micah, as he just starts by proclaiming the judgment of the Lord. Uh, he mentions, uh, in the book of Micah, it is mentioned that his ministry was during the reign of these three Judean kings. And it is important for us to know probably why these kings are mentioned. Uh, for both Israel and Judah, their sins certainly began with their leaders, irreverence towards God. We can all agree that leaders can potentially plunge their people, even a whole nation, into moral decay. This is a good thought, even as we consider these kings mentioned in the chapter, in the opening chapter. Jotham was a reasonably good king, yet he still fails to abolish idol worship. He did not tear down the high places that were dedicated towards the worship of idols. Ahaz was outrightly evil. He institutionalized idol worship, even sacrificed his own son to the pagan gods. He desecrated the temple to please the Assyrians. And you see that the nation declines into idolatry and moral decay. Hezekiah, who was the exception, was just, godly, and he reformed Judean worship. You see that the nation generally prospers, yet he falls to pride when he was trying to please the Babylonians 
uh, and he showed them all the treasures that were there in the king's treasury. The nation sees prosperity, though judgment is promised. Now, you may be wondering why all this is important. The simple answer is that all that these kings did attracted God's judgment. And sure enough, God pronounces his judgment towards his people. Now, we see that one of, the sins, one of their sins mentioned in chapter 1 is the sin of idolatry. And we see in chapter 1, verse 7, when, they talk, uh, when the word of the Lord, as Micah proclaims, talks about the carved images. He talks about, uh, yeah, he talks about a carved, a carved images and her idols. And these were just signif signifying their idol worship. But not just that. Look at, uh, look at what he says in chapter 2, from verse 2. And this is directed towards the leaders. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. The, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. Now, he, uh, Micah also points towards injustice by those in authority. We will see in chapter 3 that uh, uh, he will talk about the, the, the rulers, he will talk about the heads of the house of Jacob, he will talk about the prophets, uh, he will talk about the priests who are corrupt and required money for them to render public services. And so, one of the things about God's judgment is that it is just, it is a just judgment because God is giving what is appropriate for their evil. Let me highlight this one example. Now, in chapter 2, as he begins, he points towards those who devise wickedness in their beds. And then he goes ahead to point in chapter 2, uh, it goes ahead to point in chapter 2, uh, verse 3. Therefore, thus says the Lord, against this family, I am devising disaster. To those that devise disaster against others, he is also devising disaster. This is just one example I can cite from the scripture. Now, we also see that God will take from those who took from others. We see that he will deny rest to those that lay in wait to do others harm. He will turn from the cries of those that were violent to others. He would deny enjoyment of material things to those that acquired it falsely. But in line, also in line with seeing that, uh, in line with the fact that God's judgment is just, we saw that it was severe and wrathful. The pictures that we see in chapter 1 of the undoing of creation, when the Lord treads upon the high places, and when he... Uh, and as he treads on the high places, the mountains are splitting open. This picture of undoing of creation points to the wrathful nature, this wrathful and severe nature of God's judgment. We see the utter ruin of Samaria and Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord tells us about uh, these cities being reduced into heaps and ruins. A apart, from, apart from the fact that God's judgment was just, and we see it in how severe and wrathful it was. We also see that God's judgment was sure. It was a sure judgment. Because God must judge sin. The damnation or the punishment upon these nations was not going to fail. Look at what he says in chapter 2 verse 3. When he says that, Therefore thus says the Lord, I am planning disaster against these people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity, from which they will not be able to save themselves. God is just, and his justice demands that he must punish sin. And at this point, you're probably wondering, or you're probably asking, why God is wrathful. Now, we do know, we can actually refer to the sinfulness of these people, but what is the basis upon which God considered these uh, people to be against him or to have gone against him? First way we can answer that question about God's basis for his judgment is that God had proven himself faithful and just to his people. We see the Lord as he passes his indictment on his people. 
He says in chapter 6, verse 3, and this is what he says, chapter 6, from verse 3 to 5. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Bala, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And then he goes ahead and says, With what shall I come before the Lord? In verse, in chap, in verse 6, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with cows a year old? With, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of, of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice love, and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now, he begins by calling them my people to remind them of his covenant relationship with them. God did not say that about other nations. He did not say my people. He did not call other nations his people. He reminds them of his covenant faithfulness when he delivered them from bondage in Egypt and kept them from harm and also that he kept his covenant with them. The fact is that they belong to God as a covenant people and he had freed them so that they may continue in a full covenant relationship with himself as their God and them as his people. Do the words, let my people go so that they may worship me, ring a bell to you? God had freed them for himself and to himself. And so he reminds them of his covenant faithfulness as a basis for why he is going to judge them. Now, along with that, he also made his statutes known to them. As a covenant people, they had the law to guide them in their relationship with God. This is what he actually uh, refers to when he says, He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. In short, Micah is reminding them, or the, or the word of the Lord as it comes through Micah reminds them, Hey, I have given you the law, which will be summed up as do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. And so what God expected from them was faithful devotion. When he says walk humbly with your God, the word your, the possessive word your, personalizes this God to say that, their worship should be directed exclusively to this one true God, Yahweh. There's a good link between this and Exodus 20, when the Lord begins to give uh, the people of Israel his law. And he, begins, he began by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you, out of, who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Every time God would remind them of the law, he would remind them of his covenant relationship. But not only that, God required faithful devotion and also required that the people walk in obedience, that they would walk in his ways according to his statutes, which Micah uh, very well summarizes in three words, justice, kindness, and humility, walking humbly before God. Consequently, these people were accountable to God. God would reward them for doing good, Chapter 2, verse 7, B, do not my words do good to him that walk uprightly. And so the opposite would be true because the covenant, was a, uh, the covenant had two aspects, reward for walking uprightly with God and punishment or judgment for straying away from the ways of the Lord. God expected that they would respond to his covenant faithfulness with obedience and worship. And, for, and, we, and we would see that uh, from the time of their fathers, the nations would always fall whenever they turned away from God and they would prosper when they walked in the ways of the Lord. But instead, in the, in the book of Micah, we are pointed to an unfaithful people who turned away from the laws of God, who turned away from, God's, from God and His ways. They did not practice justice. They hated kindness 
They were murderers, malicious and violent. Chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 uh, tells us about the rulers who would actually be violent to the extent that they would tear the skin from the flesh of, the, from the flesh of their own people. Not only that, but the fact that we see that they walked in the idolatrous ways after their kings. And, and, and Micah would remind them later on in chapter 6, verse 16, that they have followed after the ways of Omri and Ahab. And when the, word, when the name Ahab, when, the, when you hear the name Ahab, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably Naboth and his vineyard and how Ahab was oppressive in taking away from, in taking the one thing from this one person that was maybe powerless. The extent was that everyone was guilty. Micah captures this very well in, in chapter seven, verse two, when he says that the godly have perished from the earth and there is no one upright among mankind. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking that it was just the leaders that it was just the, uh, uh, the leaders who were evil. No. There was no one upright. And this is a good place for us to pause and reflect because it is so easy for us to point a finger towards the Hebrews, towards Israel and Judah. But you and I are also guilty of sin against God. Is he not our God too? And are we not his people if we have faith in Christ? He blessed us through the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ, through whom we who are not a people are now a people of God. Yet we have also loved injustice in one way or another. We may not lie in wait to kill, but how many times do we stand by and not help those in need? We may not set for ourselves images to worship, but how many times have we loved the world and its possessions, which have become an idol to us, and careers more than God? maybe even our families. Perhaps it's the violence in our words when, we, when all we say tears someone to shreds from on the inside or the lack of honesty among us who are God's people, believers in Christ. Clearly, we are, not less, we are no less deserving of God's judgment. But is it all doom and despair for God's people? We also see a compassionate and merciful God. God is merciful and compassionate towards the repentant sinner. And his compassionate mercy requires us to be broken over sin. And one of the, th one of the things about God's compassionate mercy, as we see in the book of Micah, is that God preserves a remnant. In chapter 4, from verse 6 and 7, after Micah has introduced uh, what will happen in the latter days, he says in verse 6 and 7 in chapter 4, In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted and the lame I will make a remnant and those who are cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time, from this time forth and forevermore. And so God is faithful to preserve a remnant. One interesting thing we must not uh, ignore is that Micah himself is one good example of this remnant. Micah himself is one good example of this remnant. He contrasts himself to the evil nations. He would say in chapter 3 verse 8, he would use this uh, uh, juxtaposition, but as for me, he contrasts himself to the false prophets who preached for money as one filled with the power of the Spirit of God, as one filled with justice, unlike the unjust uh, rulers in Israel and leaders. He would contrast himself in that when there was no one left that could be called upright who trusted in the Lord, he is one who still trusts in the Lord. We not only see that, but we also see the mention of the remnant from Jacob who are referred to as 
dew from the Lord like showers on the grass. In chapter 3 verse 12. Or they are also referred to as lions among beasts in chapter 5 verse 8. This to simply mean that God will use them to refresh the nations like dew from the Lord like showers on the grass. The second analogy like lions among beasts is that God will raise them as a strong nation to judge the evil nations. And this is where I'd pause and ask, can those who do not know Christ testify that we are any different from this world? Can we uh, confidently say like Micah, but as for me, are we the beautiful contrast to the evil around us in rebuking what is wrong, in giving services without seeking a bribe, in our trust in God? I challenge you as I challenge myself that we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Christians and church leaders can be impactful to, impactful to their nations. As I say this, I remember Pastor Jeremy's message from Obadiah, that sometimes we imagine that what we need is a Christendom, a Christian state. But really what we need is to be the difference in those various areas where we can be impactful. If we, can, uh, uh, if we are in the civil leadership, can we be seen to be different, honest, transparent, offering services without seeking a bribe, ruling justly? May we be spurred and encouraged to shine our light so that all may see and glorify God. But God not only preserves a remnant, we, we see that he sends a redeemer. And at this point, I would narrow, narrow into uh, this redeemer that he talks about in chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 5, he says, but, verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me a ruler uh, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel one whose coming forth is from of old from ancient days therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and they shall dwell secure for now. He shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. Clearly we see Christ in the passage. One born in Bethlehem. Just as in the prophecies. But in this we see the pictures of a deliverer. We see the picture of a judge and executor of justice. And for this we can even refer to chapter 4 verse 3 when he shall judge for many nations. We see an eternal king. We see his eternal reign forever and ever, from this time and forevermore. We see him as ruler of all nations, as shepherd to the flock. And as a shepherd, he will both protect and feed his flock. He is the shepherd king. And he shall be their peace. And this is where I would ask us to pause and question. Because throughout the book of Micah, we see injustice. We see oppression. And the question is, where have we placed our hope? For most of us, we believe that our hope will be in the next president of whatever nation we come from. Unfortunately, for us, our only true hope can come from, from Christ because only Christ can rule with justice. And because only Christ can rule with justice. Perhaps uh, one thing we may also not want to overlook is the fact that God also, in his compassionate mercy, brings restoration. He brings restoration of the people. A once lawless people are now desirous of God's law. We see this in chapter 4. That they would rush to the mountain of the Lord and they would say to each other, 
Let us go to the mountain of the Lord that he may teach us his ways and so that we may walk in his path. Our people who were once idolatrous, we will see that our once uh, crushed and, and um, we will see that our, a nation that was once subdued and brought down is made mighty again, a strong nation. We will see that Jerusalem, which was a city that was built in iniquity by the evil kings, becomes a center for worship and instruction. And from Jerusalem shall go forth the law of God. Friends, not only is God just to render due punishment for our sin, but God is also merciful. And as we think about this, uh, this is a challenge to us. I challenge you as I challenge myself. As we see the injustice around us, do we cause, do, does this cause us to ask ourselves how we have contributed towards it? In the book of Micah, in the book of Micah, the false preachers thrived because the people wanted to hear false messages. Could it be that the injustices around us thrive because we have given a foothold? If there would be no people if there would be no people for corrupt leaders to collect bribes from, then would they have any reason to be corrupt? If we did not, uh, if, if we did not encourage such practices, are we not guilty of participating? But yet at the same time, are we prayerful about the injustices around us? Do you take time to pray for other nations that perhaps you may come from a setup that uh, may not have seen some of these vices, but do you take time to pray for other nations that you know go through such injustices? Is your hope in the Lord or is your hope in the next political ruler of your nation? Have you redirected your ultimate hope? But even as we think about God's mercy, are you as gracious and as compassionate in reaching out to those that are not God's people with the gospel of Christ? And so I would like us to just uh, reflect on that and let's, let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is active and alive and sharper than a double-edged sword. We thank you, Father, because it is through your word that we can be made more into your image by your power, by your spirit who is within us. But Lord, how we pray that even as we reflect on your justice upon sin, even as we reflect up, uh, on your uh, compassionate mercy that God we will be broken about our sinfulness we will be desirous to turn to you we will be desirous to see others turn to you as well as we share the gospel with them and we will be as gracious to them in pointing them to the cross as you were with us when you redeemed us We pray that, Lord, we may be the beautiful contrast that we will confidently be able to say, but as for me, in whatever place you have put us to be of impact. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and I pray that you may have a fruitful week.